Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Nairi Woods, Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government, and I'd like to welcome to the stage to open this year's Kyoto Prize at Oxford, Professor Louise Richardson, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Oxford. Louise. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all to the third Kyoto Prize at Oxford. And I'm particularly glad to welcome back our friends from the Inamuri Foundation. And in particular, Mrs. Inamuri Kanazawa. We meet in the Blavatnik School of Government, but specifically, we are now in the Inamuri Forum, which is named in honor of your father, Dr. Kazuo Inamori, and I hope you will bring him back our warmest greetings. Last month, um, we held our first alumni reunion in Tokyo. We brought people from across the collegiate university to meet with our alums living in Japan, and we all had a fabulous time. Personally, I took a day off and spent an extra day going to visit Kyoto. I very much wanted to see this extraordinary city, which has lent its name to this prize and to so many other uh, historic temples and so on. It was a wonderful and inspiring visit. I also, I have to say, envy the bullet train. Um, for centuries, the University of Oxford has sought to improve the world through a commitment to excellence and in pursuit of truth. The founding values of the Quixote Prize, created by Dr. Inamori in 1984, resonate with those ideals. It is awarded to those, and I quote, who have contributed significantly to the scientific, cultural, and spiritual betterment of mankind. Over the coming two days, we will hear from this year's three prize winners each of whom embodies this founding spirit. I'd like to offer a warm welcome to Dr. Carl Dyserot, Ms. Dr. Masaki Kashiwara, and Ms. Joan Jonas. I mentioned excellence. Oxford University is proud for the third successive year to be declared the best university in the world in the Times Higher Education World University Rankings. We're particularly proud of the breadth of our scholarship, from our world-leading medical sciences division to our departments in the humanities, from the mathematical, physical, and life sciences to the social sciences. We pride ourselves not only on the quality of our research and on our teaching, but also on its diversity. Having this year's Kyoto Kyoto laureates with us is a chance not only to hear from them, but also to share with them some of the research taking place in Oxford. Colleagues and students in mathematics, art, neuroscience, and psychiatry are greatly looking forward to spending time with the prize winners in the coming two days. I know that colleagues and students here at the Blavatnik School have been looking forward to this occasion. One of the things the Bravatnik School and the Kyoto Prize philosophy share is a belief that ability, excellence, and single-minded dedication are necessary, but not sufficient conditions for great leadership, whether in government, in the arts, or in the sciences. True leadership is also based on deep values, values that turn individual excellence into wider benefit for humanity. In his founding statement when launching the Kyoto Prize, Dr. Inamori wrote that he, and I quote, would like to redress the relative lack of formal recognition for highly dedicated but unsung researchers. Now that sentiment will find a welcome reception in every university in the world, and especially this one. But he also said, I hope to honor people who have made ex extraordinary contributions to science, civilization, and spirituality, and thereby to motivate them and others like them to reach still greater heights. 
I hope that everyone participating in these two days will all be motivated and inspired by what you hear in the coming days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor, and, and thank you all for joining us here today for the first of the Kyoto Prize Lectures. It's my great delight here in the Inamori Forum, and it is, again, I'd like to repeat, a special honor to have Mrs. Shinobu Kanazawa Inamori here with us today, along with Himeda-san and his colleagues from the Inamori Foundation. Um, but to have here in the Inamori Forum the first lecture, and it is by the laureate Dr. Carl Dyseroth. Dr. Dyseroth is the D.H. Chen Professor of Bioengineering and Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at Stanford University and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. He's best known, as I'm sure at least half this audience knows well, for his seminal work in optogenetics a breakthrough technique that's revolutionized the way scientists can investigate the brain. That means helping understand disorders like schizophrenia, depression, Parkinson's disease. And let me say with some pride that optogenetics has a special place here at Oxford. We have another of its pioneers in our Wayne Fleet Professor of Physiology, Professor Giro Miesenbach. And it's with pride that I note that Professors Miesenbach and Dyseroff have, with four other colleagues, shared both the 2013 Brain Prize and the 2019 Rumford Prize for the invention and refinement of optogenetics. Dr. Dyseroff has been honored in numerous other ways, both individually and with colleagues, including winning the Harvey Prize, the Fresenius Research Prize, the Dixon Prize in Medicine, the Lurie Prize in Biomedical Sciences, and the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. He has the distinction of being the youngest ever Kyoto Laureate. And we're sorry that your two young sons couldn't join you on this particular um, event. And winning in the category of Advanced Technology so I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Dr. Carl Dyseroth, who has kindly agreed to take questions at the end of his session. So Dr. Dyseroth, a huge welcome to the Kyoto Prize in the Inamori Forum at the Blavatnik School. Thank you uh, so much for the gracious introduction and to all of you uh, for being here. I'm looking forward to sharing our work with you, uh, both some of the earliest roots, uh, the foundations of our science, and some very recent, even uh, unpublished work to bring you up to the minute and to share some of the, the very, very most uh, uh, timely uh, uh, advances uh, and steps forward in the field. Now, at the same time, I also want to highlight how some of the first steps that one takes uh, can be extremely small and humble, inexpensive, cheap, and almost uh, embarrassing to look back on at how, how simple and humble the early experiments were. And I think that's for all the people here who uh, either are students or who know students to convey that spirit. I think it's uh, important. Uh, to realize that science can become big, it can become expensive, it can be intricate, but the early spirit that leads one to take the very first uh, curiosity-driven step uh, can be very small and very uh, important. Now, I'm a uh, psychiatrist. Uh, I'm also a neuroscientist. I think about the brain. I try to understand how it works, how the magical properties of the brain, seemingly magical properties, arise from its cells, the cells that uh, fill the skull, that connect with each other, that connect with muscles. And this is a very complex problem. It's hard to understand how it works. It's hard to understand how it fails to work. And so what we've done is try to build uh, technologies, uh, new tools, new approaches that allow us to ask new kinds of questions. And uh, optics, the use of light, has turned out to be very useful for us. 
Uh, the brain uh, is very well adapted to the use uh, of light. Light can penetrate through it. Uh, it doesn't absorb photons very much. We can use light with some modifications to become a very useful tool. And so this is the essence of optogenetics, using light uh, to, to probe and exchange information with the brain. Now, the deepest roots of optogenetics uh, actually uh, go as far back as uh, 18... Uh, 66. What you see here is Andrei Faminsin. This is a, a Russian uh, man who uh, lived in St. Petersburg. Uh, as you can see, he wrote in a journal uh, with a French name, but he himself wrote in German, so a very uh, international flavor to his work. But he was a botanist, and he studied the movement of single-celled uh, algae. The experiment he did was very simple. You can see a dish uh, of uh, algae that he illuminated from the side with light, and he found that that caused the algae to accumulate on one side of the dish. And with a brighter light, the algae would back off to an intermediate location. And so this was plant's behavior. He was a botanist. And these single-celled algae, the species he studied was called Chlamydomonas, turned out to carry a secret that allowed us to unlock uh, animal behavior. Would have been impossible to predict that this botanist would give us this power 150 years later. And so it's also a testament to the value of pure basic science. Now, uh, the fast forwarding to 1999, uh, Francis Crick uh, in his later years, uh, was thinking about the brain and how to study the brain, how to overcome challenges that people had in studying the brain. And in his perceptive way, he thought uh, what we're lacking is a way to turn particular kinds of brain cell neurons on or off. Uh, all brain cells respond to electricity, so you can't use an electrode and pick out one kind of cell or another. And he said, what if we could do this with light? Uh, he had no idea how to do this. Uh, as he said, this seems rather far-fetched, as you can see in this quote here. Uh, so he had no idea how to do it, but in his perceptive way, he had framed the problem uh, very well. And a number of people, including uh, Gero Miesenbach here at Oxford, uh, took pioneering steps to confer photosensitivity, light sensitivity, uh, onto neurons. The approach that we took in my lab beginning in 2004 was somewhat orthogonal and unusual. We reached back to these single-celled algae and took genes from these single-celled organisms and put these genes into neurons. And that what makes the microbial genes special, what allows Chlamydomonas to respond to light in a fundamentally different way than our vertebrate retinas respond to light, or that other multicellular organism retinas respond to light, is that these microbes, being very small and very compact, they do things very efficiently. The proteins they make that allow them to respond to light receive a photon and create electricity, create current, all with a single gene, a single gene encoding a single protein. And this makes them very special uh, beautiful molecular machines and very useful for this goal uh, that uh, we called optogenetics. On the left here, you can see what Chlamydomonas looks like. It's a single-celled organism, but it has two flagella, these green uh, filamentous structures. You can see it uses these flagella to swim through uh, the water. And what we hoped to do was to do what neither electrical nor magnetic interventions could achieve, those cannot distinguish two kinds of cell that may be right next to each other but do completely different things. With optogenetics, we thought, what if we could introduce these microbial opsin genes into one kind of cell or another and then flash light, and only the cells that had received the gene would be responding. Now, movement of ions across the membrane of a cell, this is electricity. This is how neurons communicate and transmit information. And indeed, these opsins that the algae made 
One of them particularly called a channel rhodopsin opens a channel, opens a hole in the membrane of a cell and allows charged particles to flow across the membrane. The very simple experiment I did is shown in the upper left here. This was in uh, July 1st, uh, 2004. The top image is a single neuron in a dish where I put in this channel rhodopsin gene coupled to a yellow fluorescent protein so I could see where it went in the cell. And you can see a sort of a circular structure. That is the outer membrane of the neuron. The bottom image uh, shows another neuron, but it's from a different dish. It's a dish that I illuminated with light. You can see the channel rhodopsin coupled to the yellow fluorescent protein still, but you see a new signal here in red. That's a marker, a biochemical marker, that this neuron has been activated, that its membrane has been, as we say, depolarized. Ions have flowed across the membrane, and it's been activated. The top dish I had delivered the gene for channel rhodopsin, but I had not illuminated the bottom image. I had done both, delivered the gene and illuminated. And I could see more of these activated cells in the dish that I had illuminated. And I'm showing this page from my notebook just to show, to make the point I made earlier of how simple and humble this experiment was. It probably cost only $100 or so to, to, to carry out. But it, it de-risked the whole process. At this point, I then knew that I could put a gene from algae into a mammalian neuron and activate it with light. Of course, that was only the beginning of the process. A great deal more, more work needed to be done. We had to figure out how to get those genes. That was all done in a dish. We next had to do it in living, behaving animals. In the middle, you can see viral strategies. We put the gene into viruses. We injected the viruses into mouse brains. Over on the uh, far right, you can see these spiky structures. These are, this is an electrical recording from a neuron, and each little spike, what we call an action potential, is being driven by a little pulse of blue light. As you can see, the little dashes of blue show the blue pulses of light that are uh, eliciting the uh, action potentials in the targeted cells. And then finally, we had to get the light into the brain, and we developed fiber optic strategies, as I, as I uh, um, have depicted uh, here. And the end result is we had freely moving animals where we could deliver light and control neurons. The moment when we first knew this would work came in 2007, when one of my students, Feng Zhang, had delivered a fiber optic uh, into the right side of a mouse's brain, where there was channel rhodopsin in one layer of its neocortex. The neocortex is a thin millimeter, two millimeter thick uh, layer of cells. Oops, um, did I just turn this off? I think I might have. There we go. A thin layer of cells uh, that's a, like a sheet coating our, our, the surface of our brains. And what he did was put a fiber optic into the right side of the brain, and we, this was a living mouse, and we hoped we might see some movement toward or attention to the left side of the world. And you'll see when the light comes on, a little blue dot will appear on the mouse's head, and it immediately starts circling left. This was a mouse that uh, was otherwise uh, behaviorally normal, just we conferred on it this desire to turn left, and when we turned off the light here, it immediately stopped. So we could take an otherwise freely moving animal and, and uh, control its behavior. This was the moment when we knew that there would be uh, perhaps uh, some value to this. We moved rapidly to developing strategies to targeting deep brain structures, studying more complex behaviors like sleep. Uh, we were targeting, for example, the lateral hypothalamus and turning on and off sleep neurons and making mice uh, uh, awaken from sleep earlier than they would have otherwise in response to specific patterns of activity. And then this uh, uh, led us to want to understand these proteins themselves more deeply. And this part of the, the work, it's basic biochemistry, understanding how these channel rhodopsin molecules work. But as you'll see, it turned out to open up whole new avenues of investigation. Basic science, understanding how these natural proteins achieve this remarkable uh, outcome of turning light into electricity. By getting down to the molecular details of how this actually happens, we created whole new possibilities for neuroscience. And I'm, I'll try to share a little bit of that excitement uh, in the next few slides. So what is a channel rhodopsin? Well, in 2011, we didn't really know. We knew that 
as indicated by these, the, the thick black arrow in the middle, that it, ions flowed uh, across the membrane, but it was controversial uh, exactly how. What was the nature of the pore or the channel that allowed this to happen? It was unprecedented for there to be a light-activated uh, channel, and nobody knew what it would look like. In the ensuing eight years, we have really uh, illuminated this uh, beautiful protein in great detail. Uh, what's shown here is the result of crystal structures, of molecular dynamics, of detailed structural modeling. The blue arrows going top to bottom show the pore that we uh, uncovered. The gray, light gray spheres are water molecules on the inside and outside of the cell. And we can see all the little stick-like elements are the positions of amino acids, parts of the protein, that create the uh, structure of the pore. And our understanding of this became so great that we could uh, even change the kind of ion that, flew, that, that, that was flowing across the membrane. The ones that channel rhodopsin normally allowed to flow were positive ions, cations. The chlamydomonas algae makes a positive ion, a cation fluxing channel rhodopsin. And that was excitatory, that was stimulatory in neural systems. If you open a channel that allows positive ions to run across the membrane, that will trigger neurons to fire. But we wanted to, in some cases, shut off, turn off neurons as well. And so we wanted to turn that cation, positive ion flux, into anion, negative ion flux, which would be predicted to inhibit neurons. But having the pore allowed us to do that. Able to, when we were able to see the structure of the pore, we, we noticed something very interesting, that the channel rhodopsin that allowed cations to flow had a largely negative lining electrostatic negative lining to its pore that might serve to exclude uh, anions and allow cations to flow. If that were the correct mechanism, we thought, what if we could reline the pore, re-upholster the whole inner lining of the, of the channel and make it positive to exclude cations and allow anions to flow like chloride? If we could do that, we might have created an inhibitory channel. And we were able to do that, as illustrated here, the initial uh, uh, strong uh, negativity, as shown in red, we were able to turn into a, a strong positivity, as shown in blue at the bottom. And we ended up creating, as you can see in the lower left, the ability to shut off action potentials, turn off action potentials with blue light instead of driving them. And we were able to create various forms of this inhibitory channel that allowed us uh, great uh, flexibility in, in the sorts of responses that we got. And indeed, we went on from here to get crystal structures from a great many different uh, 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 configurations and types of channel rhodopsin. We got the crystal structure of both cation and anion conducting channel rhodopsins, including some just uh, last year. And the outcome of all this with a fantastic team of collaborators, students, and postdoctoral fellows is that we have now many fundamentally different forms of what you might call photon spike logic. The top shows what I began with, a single light, blue light pulse giving you a single action potential. That's great, but the next one down shows we turned that logic into red light, and we were able to get red light driven action potentials. The next one down, second from the bottom, shows bistable operation. Instead of having one light pulse and one action potential, we now have one light pulse flips the cell into an ex excitable state until we terminate that state with a different color of light. And you can see three episodes of increased excitability here. And then the bottom one shows bistable inhibition, flipping the cell into a refractory state where it's not likely to fire, and then reversing that with a different color of light. So fundamentally different forms of photon spike logic all arising from our detailed structural modeling, molecular modeling, uh, and getting to know these beautiful natural proteins uh, down uh, to the angstrom level of resolution. Now, uh, enough about the proteins, although I could talk about them forever. Uh, what, what can we actually do with these, having, having created them and, and, and come to understand them uh, in more detail? The red light-driven channel rhodopsin turned out to be really, really interesting. Uh, the way we initially got to that, on the far right of this slide, you see these green spherical algae. This is a different species. This is not 
Clementomonas. This is a different algae called Volvox carteri. In 2008, we found a channel rhodopsin that was red light uh, responsive. And it didn't, it didn't work very well, but we were able to engineer it to be better and better and better until finally we had very potent red light uh, control. And that was useful because I've been talking about delivering light to a biological system to control what happens in neurons. But of course, there's another direction in which light can flow that's informative, and that's to use light to collect information from the biological system. In particular, we can use light from fluorescent neural activity sensors to image, to record the activity of neurons as well. So we can both play in and read out activity with light. Now, the best readout sensors are blue light driven. And the original channel rhodopsin we worked, we worked with was blue light driven. So it was very valuable to create a red light control channel so we could have red light control and blue light <clears throat> readout. And this Volvox channel rhodopsin allowed us to do this. We could even get to single cell control uh, with this uh, derivative of a Volvox channel rhodopsin, a VCHR, as we did in 2012. We showed that this red light driven control allowed even single cells to be controlled. And here's an example of the readouts that I'm talking about. This is a, a fish brain, but what we've done is we've put one of these blue light readouts of activity in every neuron in the brain of this fish. And all these little flashing circles of light, these are single neurons in the brain of this fish. So we can, if we knew what it was, we could read the mind of this fish and see what it was thinking. But certainly the information is incredibly rich and detailed, uh, but unless we could also play in activity, we wouldn't know what was causally significant in all these beautiful patterns. So the real power comes from integrating both play in and read out of information which the red light driven channel rhodopsins allowed. And I'll get to an example of how this works later. Now, just this year, we were able to combine red light control and blue light readout in the brains of freely behaving mice. And what I'll show you about in the next few slides is how this bidirectional exchange of information with the brain allows one to understand fundamental questions about how the brain operates. In this case, what happens when two primary motivational drives, drives to do something that's important uh, for adaptation or survival, come into conflict? And in this case, we're thinking about and studying the two drives of feeding and social interaction. Now, these are two primary drives that we have that all social animals have. Uh, sometimes they can be synergistic, sometimes they can come into conflict. For all animals that have social hierarchies, it's very important to feed only at the right time and in the right place relative to other things going on in the social uh, network around you. And this is a natural behavioral pattern. It also can become dysfunctional, as in human eating disorders, where social pressures and cues and stimuli can impair feeding behavior. In this work, we looked in orbitofrontal cortex, which is part of the neocortex, where we know both feeding and social drives are processed. And we wanted to come in at the single cell level and use optogenetics and see uh, what might happen when two drives come into conflict. We developed ways to image and control single cells in the brains of these mice. You can see as we stimulate, when the letters stim come on, you can see some cells responding. Those are labeled T, T3, T4, T5. These are cells that we're guiding spots of light to, and we're stimulating them uh, in synchrony. The, over on the right, the graph shows all the cells that we're stimulating in synchrony, all the targeted cells. And we're, getting a, we're get, doing uh, this bidirectional flow of information, playing in and reading out so we can see how we're doing. <clears throat> 
The top three traces show non-targeted cells that are doing their own thing because we're not directing spots of light to them. And you can see how well it's working. We're actually getting very uh, robust uh, and specific control of the targeted cells, uh, but not the non-targeted cells, even when they're right next to each other. So by guiding light, we get single cell uh, control. And we can go down to this deep part of cortex using a bit of optics called a Grin lens. I won't go into the details of the optics uh, much here. So then, how do we find the feeding cells? Well, we can give the animal some uh, food, in this case, uh, highly palatable, uh, high calorie reward that it can lick. And when it is looking for the food, we can see where the cells are that are responding. And in this pseudo-color map on the upper right, you can see the more yellow the cells are, those are cells that are responding to the food. So we're not stimulating them optogenetically, we're looking for the natural food responding cells and we can pick them out and see them. So we can find them and then we can come in and stimulate them. So these are cells that are naturally active during feeding. They're sprinkled in a salt and pepper fashion around cortex. Now we can come in and stimulate them. And as you can see here, we can pick out those cells and we can stimulate them and create that elevated activity exactly when we want it. And so then the question is, are these cells actually causing feeding or are they just using or encoding or, re or reporting on the stimulus for some other purpose? And what this uh, experiment revealed if you look at the two central graphs here, if we just give the food, we see a particular pattern of licking for the food. Each little orange dash is a little lick for the food. Each uh, horizontal line is a different trial, very consistent response. But if we both give the food and the optogenetic stimulation just to those targeted cells, we get more food consumption. So these cells are not only naturally active during feeding, but they actually are causally important, something we would not have known and would not have been able to show otherwise. A number of control experiments show this was a specific effect. For example, if you don't include the channel rhodopsin, you don't get that effect. That's good news. It reveals that we are indeed exerting the effect uh, by the mechanism that we thought. Okay, now what about social cells? Are they also here in orbital frontal cortex? Well, we could do the same thing. We could create a social interaction, and here we can have a uh, a juvenile animal, which adult mice find very interesting and like to explore, wandering around a little track and come and explore the uh, adult. And we can see, indeed, there are social cells that when the juvenile comes into the social zone, these cells become more active, and those are shown on the right. I'll play a little movie here. The adult mouse is shown in the upper right, and you can see when the juvenile shows up, <coughs> there's a period of social interaction. The social cells, which are the three beige traces in the uh, top middle panel, reveal the response during the social interaction. Non-social cells, the green cells at the bottom, don't show that. And these were consistent social cells. And so we could ask then, what happens to feeding when we stimulate the social cells? And what we found, uh, first that we were very good at stimulating the social cells, and what, what actually happened to feeding, that's shown in the middle panel at the bottom, and you can see the yellow lines below the gray lines, the gray line is the control, the yellow line is when we were stimulating the social cells, we actually saw reduced feeding when we stimulated the social cells, rather than the increase that we would have seen with stimulating the feeding cells. So here, in orbital frontal cortex, these two primary drives are coming into conflict, and we know exactly cells that are mediating this interaction. What's shown here, uh, if you can play this movie, this is a control experiment that shows it really is a social cue and not just the animal being uh, surprised. We made a 3D printed mouse. This is almost like a horror movie. You'll, if this movie plays, you'll see a little uh, 3D printed mouse pop up. It's actually kind of funny. Whoop, there it is. And the social cells, which are at the bottom, amazingly don't even respond to that very startling and disturbing image. They uh, don't care at all about it. It's going to happen again. No, they don't care. They really are just uh, social cells. So, and a number of control experiments like that reveal to us that we are studying what we think we're studying. A final 
question is, what if you stimulate the non-social and non-feeding cells, just other cells that are there in orbital, for, orbital frontal cortex? And those had no effect at all. They neither enhanced nor inhibited the feeding response. So all of this depended on our ability to effectively stimulate individual cells that were sprinkled in among other cells uh, within orbital frontal cortex. So this is an example of the sorts of opportunities that we have. We are now doing even much more complicated experiments. Uh, I won't have time to go into, but we've, we're working in visual cortex, and we can actually play in uh, percepts to mice now. We can make them see things that aren't there. Uh, mice that are, uh, are now able to, in complete darkness, report to us that they're seeing vertical bars when we play in stimuli that just stimulate vertical bar responsive cells, and likewise for, for horizontal. And an example of that is shown here. All the little red circles are individual vertical uh, orientation selective cells and visual cortex that we're stimulating. And the mice behaviorally respond as if they're essentially hallucinating seeing this percept that isn't there. This is what you might call modern optogenetics now. In the last couple years, really, is just when this capability has emerged. Uh, we can now work on any time scale, acute or chronic. We, uh, Using, for example, these bistable tools, we can have optogenetic interventions last as long as we want. We can excite or inhibit. We can tune the extent to which we excite or inhibit. We can target individual cells or cell types or even connections across the brain in behaving animals. And with these readouts, we can now match or modify naturally occurring patterns uh, with timing or amplitude or other features uh, as we like. Now, a lot of this is synergistic with another technology that we've developed in, in the lab. And even though this is not what the uh, Kyoto Prize was for, as you'll see in a few slides, I'll show you how exciting it is to pair optogenetics with other uh, new approaches and new technologies. Beginning in 2013, we developed a way to collect very detailed physical information from intact brains, detailed molecular and even wiring information on cells as those cells remain within the 3D environment of uh, a semi-intact brain. And to do this, we bring concepts from chemical engineering. We build uh, hydrogels inside uh, tissues. And what's depicted here uh, as you go from upper left, A, to B at the upper right, C at the lower right, and D at the lower left, you see this process that we call hydrogel tissue chemistry. We build a gel shown by the wavy green lines within all the cells of all the tissue at once, and we anchor interesting molecules, nucleic acids like RNAs and other molecules like proteins. We anchor them to this hydrogel scaffold and then we can remove uninteresting proteins, uninteresting elements like lipids that impair our ability to see deep into tissue at high resolution. And we end up with, as shown on the lower left, a new construct. It's a hydrogel with interesting molecules anchored to it, but in a very stable way that allows us to see in great detail at the subcellular level the interesting biomolecules that confer function onto the cells of interest. And what we're doing now is registering the cellular level activity information that we get from optogenetics with this sort of detailed molecular uh, understanding that comes from hydrogel tissue chemistry, including its first form, which is called uh, clarity, that we described in 2013. This is a mouse brain uh, that, uh, with long-range projection neurons labeled in green. And this is a movie of uh, a part of a mouse brain that's been made transparent. And you can see these cells uh, and their positions and their connections. You can even fly in virtually and look around and see and follow things that may be of interest. But now, if you think about this data set, you see all the individual neurons here. What if we knew? the activity pattern of each of these cells during an interesting behavior during life, and what if we knew what was causal in a behavior, as we can get from optogenetics, like in the orbitofrontal experiments I just showed you, what if we could then 
go in and get detailed molecular and wiring information from those very same cells. That would be a huge step. And this is something we're just now achieving in the lab. What makes this possible is the hydrogel-based method. It, uh, first of all, it's all aqueous-based. It's all water-based. And what that does is it means we can work with fluorescent proteins without quenching or destroying their fluorescence, like more organic solvents that other uh, prior methods uh, uh, relied upon uh, uh, would, would otherwise have uh, brought to bear. So the flu native fluorescence is preserved, and what we found is we can even do multiple rounds of labeling, get very rich molecular information. We can even sequence RNA, effectively DNA molecules that report on RNA molecules that are present in the tissue. We can sequence the transcriptome of cells that are embedded within the hydrogel matrix. I won't talk about it in detail, but just last year we described how this is done, a method called STARMAP. It's a variant of hydrogel tissue chemistry where we lock all the interesting RNAs in place in the hydrogel scaffold, and then we can actually use uh, some uh, optical and genetic tricks to sequence the RNAs that are present and anchored onto the hydrogel scaffold. And so then you, the idea is to be able to turn all these flashing spots of light into cells that we really understand because we know all the RNAs and, and uh, biomolecules that are, are present. I'm going to close with three uh, separate examples of, of applications uh, of this method. One goes back to the fish uh, experiments that I described uh, very briefly earlier. Now, why do we use fish? Well, they're vertebrates like us, but the larval zebrafish, although a free-living, free-swimming organism that hunts its own food, it is small enough and transparent enough that we can actually see the activity of every single neuron in its brain uh, during behavior. Uh, and that's depicted here. And we do this with two-photon imaging. It's a way of getting single-cell resolution imaging in intact uh, uh, tissue. The fish are head fixed in agarose. They can't move their head, but their tail is free. So by moving their tail, they can tell us whether they want uh, to move or not. And that is a useful bit of information to have. And what we did was to study a behavior relevant uh, to a, a, a clinical condition uh, which is my own clinical specialty, which is uh, depression. Now, depression has many symptoms, and we don't claim to be studying depression in fish, of course, but there is a uh, very interesting and very debilitating behavioral state transition that happens in human beings that, in which there's a deep discounting of the value of their own effort. They experience this uh, profound belief that their actions don't matter, that their actions won't affect the future, they have difficulty even seeing into the future, and this profound hopelessness can confer great uh, uh, morbidity and even mortality. Now, uh, as it happens though, as you can readily imagine, sometimes indeed one's actions are futile, and it's important for an organism to know that, to register that, and to detect when that is the case, and to adapt behavior uh, accordingly. And the adaptive behavioral state transition between active coping with a challenge and passive coping with a challenge is an important natural process. And we've studied this, as have many other groups. Uh, for example, you can put a rat or a mouse in a swim test, uh, a situation that it doesn't like. It's in a cylinder of water, and it can't escape. But it swims and tries to escape, and after a while stops and transitions to a passive state of just floating in the water. And this is a, not an unreasonable uh, transition to make. And we can see this transition to passive coping, coping happening. Uh, you can see here, this is an experiment from Melissa Warden in my lab back in 2012. You can see this transition from kicking vigorously to not kicking very much over the course of several minutes. What she had found using optogenetics back in 2012 was that uh, a projection from the forebrain to the dorsal raphe nucleus, the DRN, the source of most of the serotonin in the forebrain, favored the active coping phase. And a different projection 
to the lateral habenula, LHB, favored the passive coping phase. So this was in rats, and it was very specific testing the, the importance of very specific connections across the brain. We thought, well, what if we could do this in fish and look at every single neuron across the brain? We could get a very complete understanding of this behavioral state transition. But of course, we can't do a forced swim test because the fish love swimming, and that's just not right. So what Aaron Andelman and Vanessa Burns in my lab had to do was figure out how to do the equivalent of this, which nobody had done before, in fish. And they were able to do this, and this just was published uh, in Cell just a, a couple weeks ago. Uh, what they did was create an inescapable, aversive situation, mildly aversive, uh, once per second, a mild uh, buzz of an electric shock in a tank, nothing the animal do, does, uh, none of its actions uh, can affect uh, that aversive stimulus. And what we see is very interesting. In the lower left, in panel D, you can see in the purple line, first an active coping response where the fish swims around faster, and then a transition to a passive coping state where it swims around much less than it would be swimming otherwise, even in a control condition. And this was a very interesting response. It was very consistent. It reversed completely after some tens of minutes if you put the fish into a new tank with new water. And as shown in the lower right, the magenta line shows what happens if you do this in ketamine, a human antidepressant that's used clinically. It's slowed and delayed uh, and reduced the uh, amount of passivity seen. So this and, and other experiments really allowed us to, to uh, be confident that this was an interesting uh, model. Okay, now what is what actually happens? This movie shows a fish going through this behavioral state transition right before your eyes. You can see activity across the brain, but you might start to notice as this goes on in the two regions at the top and the bottom on the left-hand side uh, starting to become more and more active, dominating the activity. Two little clusters, top and bottom. And the movie's gonna loop around to the beginning again in a minute to show you. Here we are looped back to the beginning. You can see those structures weren't that active beforehand. Uh, but as you'll see, these, they become more active as this behavioral state transition happens. What are those structures? Amazingly, those are the fish equivalents of the lateral habenula the same structure that in the rats favored the passive state. So this really gave us some confidence that we were onto something that might be valid and that might be ancestral in the, in the vertebrate lineage. And this was a consistent finding. It was the, the lateral habenula homologous region gave the only elevation in activity that we saw across the brain. There was a decrease in the raphe, the fish raphe, which the opposite direction effect, which also mapped onto the opposite direction effects that we had seen in rats. Again providing us confidence that we were seeing something interesting. And then we also noticed some interesting single cell resolution effects. Some cells didn't, in the habenula didn't go through this state transition for quite some time, and then became more active later in the stressful period. Others ticked on almost immediately. And when we, when we looked at de in detail at this, we saw that the the habenula of the fish carries cells that, as the duration of the stressor continues, it continually ticks on new cells until it's building up this representation of this very important statistic of the stressor, how long it's been going on, which of course is very relevant to determining whether one should go through a behavioral state transition uh, to a passive state. So the habenula seems to be encoding and representing this very important statistic of the stressor in this very interesting way by adding new active cells. Now, all of this is observational. We're just seeing what happens. We don't actually know that the habenula neural activity is causal in the behavioral state transition. And that's where optogenetics now comes into the story, allowing us to test that. Is it, does it matter? And so what we did was to target channel rhodopsin to the lateral habenula using zebrafish genetics, as we did. And then what we saw behaviorally in panel D, what's shown in black is fish that don't have channel rhodopsin in the habenula. And if you 
have a light period as shown in light blue in the middle, the fish will swim around a little more if you expose them to, to blue light, and that reverses immediately when you turn off the light. So that's just a normal light response of fish. But if fish have channel rhodopsin in their habenula, you don't see that. In fact, you see a slight decrease as shown in blue. And that difference is small between the channel rhodopsin expressing and non-expressing fish, but that's in naive fish, as we say, fish that have not had anything bad happen to them that we know about. If you go to the panel on the far right, panel E, these are fish that have been through the inescapable stress, and there we see a profound and lasting passivity elicited, elicited by causally stimulating the habenula neurons. So this gave us evidence of causality. Exciting the habenula, mimicking this naturally occurring pattern that we had seen favored passivity. We also found that we could suppress, using an inhibitory optogenetic strategy, that we could suppress that native habenular activity and reverse the passivity. And that's shown here. The panel on the left in the pink period uh, in the middle, that shows the stressor, the duration of the stressor, and what's plotted on the y-axis is the fish movement speed. You can see that very early active coping response and then transitioning to a passive coping state where it barely moves at all. And then the yellow light period, when we deliver yellow light to stimulate in this particular inhibitory optogenetic tool, we see the fish revert back to the active state. And this movie, you can see the little dot quivering in the corner, that's a fish in the passive state. There'll be some small little zips around, but it's not moving too much. And when the yellow light comes on, you'll see what it actually it's active coping state. So we can instantaneously flip the, cell, the animal into an active coping state, even when it's in the passive coping state. So this habenular activity is necessary and sufficient and naturally occurring, uh, and that gives us uh, 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 a strong foundation uh, to, to believe that this is important. Of course, if you play the top movies here, uh, and then we'll play the bottom ones in a moment, we're just scratching the surface of these data sets. We have many tens of thousands of, of neurons that we're collecting across the brain. What's shown on the top is a fish uh, where the left is the raw data, the right is automatically segmented and, and uh, uh, analyzed data. Uh, if you play the bottom movies, this is a fish going through the behavioral state transition. The tiny little squares uh, show the actual fish moving. And you can see we have these quite immense data sets. I'm just reporting on the habenular activity that leapt out to our eyes, but of course there's much more uh, to be mined and understood in these uh, more or less complete uh, brain-wide uh, data sets. In particular, what are these cells in the habenula, the early responders, the middle responders, the late responders, are they molecularly different? Does aspects of, the, for example, their ion channel expression explain how they get selectively uh, recruited uh, into the active ensemble? These are interesting questions that we now have the capability to address because we can observe and control activity and then get detailed molecular understanding of those very same cells in the same organism. The next, the final two stories to tell you about uh, have to do with uh, fundamental survival drives. Uh, we worked on sleep and feeding and social interaction, but I, what, I want, what I would like to talk about here is uh, thirst. And uh, this is work uh, that my lab has been working on over the past uh, a number of years. Uh, uh, work actually um, um, uh, co-led by Will Allen and uh, a Rhodes Scholar who's in uh, attendance here. Uh, so some of you uh, may know. Uh, raise your hand if you could, yeah. <laughs> so excellent. So Michael is, was an extremely talented student uh, who uh, co-led uh, this work and uh, we are very uh, grateful for his contribution and I want to tell you a little bit about this uh, this uh, most recent uh, version of this work. So we've been uh, studying thirst uh, in mice and we've been studying the neural, the brain-wide neural manifestations of, of thirst. And we can't see all through the mouse brain in the way we can with a fish, but we can actually get detailed uh, brain-wide recording using uh, electrodes. And these are called neuropixels probes. These have uh, uh, 
long, uh, what we call shanks and very high density electrodes on them so we can collect the activity of many neurons across the brain. And uh, what we have done is, is while we have, while we're recording electrically the activity of neurons in the brain, we're making it possible for a thirsty mouse to drink a little water. So it's a very simple task. We have a thirsty mouse and we give it a little cue, a little odor cue that tells it some water will be coming. And then it, the water comes and then it can lick. So extremely simple, it's called a go, no go task. There are two odors. One, the green odor predicts that there will be uh, water that comes. The purple odor, coated odor indicates that there will not be uh, water coming. And the mice learn this association very well. And so uh, you can see in the lower left, the animals responding to what we call the go cue, the odor predicting water, they lick very vigorously for water until they become sated and then they stop licking at all, as you can see at the very bottom. Even very thirsty mice, though, won't lick for the no-go cue, the odor that doesn't predict water. So they really know what they're doing. They understand the task. They know uh, what's going to be happening. And recording all across the brain, uh, what do you see when a thirsty mouse has the option, the availability of water? You'll see three vertical dotted lines as shown here. Uh, the first vertical dotted line means the onset of the odor. The second line is the offset of the odor. The third line is the onset of the reward. And recording all across the brain, what do we see? The names of the regions are, are abbreviated. It doesn't matter what they are. They're color-coded in this vertical bar, but we're recording from all across the brain. And you see these three vertical dotted lines for the go cue and the no-go cue. Red means more neural activity. Blue means less neural activity. And what we can see is that all across the brain, neurons are responding. Virtually the entire brain is engaged by this uh, task of drinking water when thirsty. And in fact, more than half of all the neurons across the brain are engaged with this uh, uh, task. So that was a big surprise, first of all. A lot of interesting questions. Why is that the case? Why does the whole brain need to know what's happening and what's going to happen, what the animal is planning? And that's a very uh, interesting philosophical and scientific question that we can talk about. But where the optogenetics then becomes interesting is we could ask, what if we stimulate a thirst neuron, a neuron that optogenetically we found causes thirst, do we elicit this full, complex, brain-wide state, or do we create some bizarre, aberrant state? And this was a very important question for us to answer in studying optogenetics. Yes, we can stimulate neurons, we can create behaviors, but are we doing it through a naturalistic uh, mechanism? And this was the question that finally we could address and answer for the first time. So what we did here was stimulate the thirst neurons, the input to some thirst neurons that come through a structure called the SFO as shown here. So we got a tiny little spot of light we're optogenetically stimulating deep in the brain. And these were neurons that, that Will and Michael had found were causally involved in, in thirst. And in the lower left, you can see what happens when you optogenetically stimulate these neurons. You can have a thirsty mouse, it's drinking, 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 and then as you get below trial 200, it becomes sated and it's not drinking anymore. But then we, with the blue light shows when we optogenetically stimulate the input to the thirst cells, and boom, this mouse that has been drinking vigorously is completely sated, suddenly is acting like it's thirsty again and is vigorously drinking for water in response to the cue. Okay, so that's the behavior. What's happening across the brain when we're delivering this optogenetic stimulation? And the amazing thing is shown here. Uh, the thirsty brain-wide pattern is shown in the first vertical column. The same mouse, sated, is shown in the second column. Then the sated mouse getting the optogenetic stimulation is shown in the third column. We're recapitulating uh, almost exactly the brain-wide pattern that naturally occurs during thirst, even with this very focal optogenetic stimulation of the thirst neurons. Uh, 
And so this uh, just came out in, in science uh, uh, a month or so ago and was really important uh, for the field in, in revealing that if you do optogenetics uh, right, if you target correctly, you, you elicit these very complex naturalistic brain-wide dynamics. The uh, question I often get asked, uh, is optogenetics uh, clinically relevant? I'm a psychiatrist. I still see patients, uh, but I'm not running clinical trials or anything like that. Personally, uh, I see that we are in a long period of discovery about the brain. We have much to understand about the fundamental principles before we start to think about an optogenetic intervention. But understanding and knowledge of any kind is very valuable, and what we're already seeing is optogenetics-guided clinical trials that are already starting and have, some have concluded and shown very interesting results. For example, uh, in 2013, uh, a different group led by Anto Banchi at the National Institute on Drug Abuse in the United States found with optogenetics that they could suppress cocaine-seeking behavior of rats by stimulating optogenetically in the prefrontal uh, cortex. And it was such a striking result that they started a clinical trial and used a different brain stimulation method, but one that was already up and running for people, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and they delivered this to human beings with cocaine addiction, and they found uh, a suppression of uh, cocaine consumption uh, in this population compared to the control group. Uh, of course, early stages, much more needs to be done, but it set the, the it revealed the principle of optogenetics guided clinical trial and reveals, of course, what we all know, that just basic understanding, basic discovery could make any kind of uh, uh, clinical uh, treatment more precise and reliable. And the final point I'll just close on is that uh, I think it's quite uh, important as a, a story, as a parable, if you will, of, of the value of basic science that getting to the, the detailed, you know, atomic level of understanding of how these elegant natural proteins work has enabled us to understand fundamental aspects of how animals work and our basic motivational and survival drives in healthy and uh, maladaptive states. And going even further back, that the roots in botany would have been, of course, uh, impossible to predict at the time, and I think is a good story to tell to people, uh, leaders of society, politicians, people who you know, friends, colleagues, a story important to tell so that everybody perhaps can come to value basic science as much as we do. I'll conclude there. I'm very grateful to all of you for your time. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this work. Uh, there's much more to say, much more to come in the future. Um, I've been privileged to work with such an amazing team of students and postdoctoral fellows and collaborators uh, around the world. And I'm tremendously grateful to the Inamori Foundation and the Kyoto Prize for, for recognizing this work. I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Time for questions? Yeah? Okay. So happy to take any questions. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. Great questions. Um, magnetogenetics. Uh, uh, so the, the the principle of optogenetics in principle could be extended uh, any, in principle, the, any energy or information delivery could become specific if you could create a little antenna on the cells of interest, just as we create a light antenna effectively for optogenetics. Uh, and so people have thought about ultrasound or magnetism, and this is uh, magnetogenetics. Um, it's, uh, it, there were a couple years ago, there were some studies purporting to show uh, a magnetogenetic effect. Those, to my knowledge, have not been reproduced. We've tried to reproduce them in my own lab and, and failed. Uh, 
Um, so I think that at least the, the most uh, simple version of magnetogenetics is, is not working. Uh, there is something that does work, which I would call uh, magnetothermal approaches. And they're uh, a combination of nanoparticles, which create heat in response to, to, to light, and genetic introduction of a heat responsive protein, the TRIP-V1 protein. That does work. It's, uh, that's been reproduced multiple times. Um, and so that's a way of turning uh, a, a non-optical source of information delivery into local neural activity. It has some disadvantages. First of all, it's a multi-component system. You have to get the nanoparticles in, as well as the gene, and, 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 uh, um, and that's, that makes it more tricky. But I think it may find some value. Uh, second question. Yeah, so dreads are a chemical method of uh, information delivery, and there the antenna is a receptor for the chemical, and so that, that does work. It works quite well, of course. You lose all the temporal resolution of, of, of optogenetics. You can't play in precise patterns or inhibit precisely because you have sort of hours long time scale of the chemical coming on or off, but it certainly does work. It's useful if you want uh, more brain-wide uh, effects in a, in a mammal uh, where you, you are unable to deliver light brain-wide. And yes, you certainly can combine uh, optogenetics and, and uh, uh, chemogenetics dreads uh, uh, quite well. Yes? I'm probably abusing my role, but you showed a striking footage of a mouse that you were making run round and round to the left. Do you worry about the, the uses of this? You know, the idea that a government could control its population, the idea that an individual could, like what's the dystopia of this? And, and what are the ways that either as a scientific community, you know, or as a society, you protect against that kind of misuse? It's a, uh, a great question. Uh, it's one that we have thought about. Uh, and I think it is a common response that that, that video is uh, a little disturbing uh, of the mouse being induced instantaneously to turn left and then uh, instantaneously for that effect to reverse. Uh, and, and so one question to ask, why is that disturbing? Uh, uh, it, of course, we've controlled behavior in other ways uh, in many other ways, uh, all our medications that we use affect behavior. Um, our words affect behavior, but we're not disturbed by those as much. But it's it, 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 the visceral response that that creates is is partly its speed and its precision, uh, and it raises this, the specter of could this be misused in, in some way. Now it doesn't act at a distance. This is one maybe a good thing about it. It couldn't be a, a weapon of war. You can't project it over, over a long range. It requires a gene and it requires a light delivery and surgery and, and so on. But it, it, we can make mice uh, want more or less of anything that we want. We can make them more or less hungry or thirsty or sleepy or sexual or social or, or reward seeking. We can turn up and down the quality of their memories. Uh, uh, almost anything that you can think of, people have shown that you can you can uh, affect w what a mouse wants and, and how much it wants of it, and uh, and and you can make it fear a neutral environment. It's it's quite remarkable how much you can do, and so could you know? And of course, mice and human beings have uh, very homologous uh, you know brains. Their brains are much smaller, but the same basic structures are there, just uh, shrunk down. So you, you could imagine, uh, you know, to your question of dystopia, there, there's a, you know, an, uh, something that we should at least talk about. It's not a pressing issue at the moment. It's not as urgent as the, the, the CRISPR situation, for example, where we have already genome edited uh, babies living on the planet now. Uh, this uh, is uh, not something that is currently being done uh, in human brains, but it could be done, and it's something where we have to stay ahead of the, the, the challenge. We have to keep the conversation going between the ethicists and the, and the scientists. And uh, like any new technology, uh, I think that's the key, is to keep the conversation uh, going, but not a, not a pressing issue at the moment. Yeah. 
how this interplays with kind of the strategy to target sensor proteins or optogenetic probes to cell types by targeting them with genes specifically controlled by neuron type A or neuron type B, and how, these, how, how well these will play together. Yeah, uh, this is actually very relevant, uh, and, you know, it really highlights, so the question is, is, you know, cell typology and even more important, targeting cell types, which I haven't talked much about, but of course is fundamental to this method. You could make all the beautiful optogenetic tools you want, but if you can't target them to cells of interest, you're going to be greatly limited. And we and others have been working very hard on identifying cell types and making cell types targetable genetically uh, uh, by virtue of their type. Uh, and this has been happening at exactly the same time. There's been a lot of back and forth between the two fields, and they've been extremely synergistic, uh, helping drive each other forward very, very much. So, for example, uh, we designed uh, viruses. So we get a lot of the genes, the optogenetic genes, into cells by virus. And we use adeno-associated viral vectors. Mostly, these are very safe, harmless uh, viruses, but they're very good at bringing genes into neurons. Uh, but in their wild-type form, they would just deliver the gene to all the neurons. Uh, and you can put in little bits of DNA called promoters that help bias it toward one cell type or another. But those are not truly versatile. You can't target any cell type with a promoter. So uh, one thing we did was uh, create conditional viruses, broken uh, viruses that don't work because they're missing a recombinase. They're missing another bit of uh, DNA that allows them to be fixed and allows them to express. And these recombinases uh, can be delivered separately. Uh, you can make an animal line, a mouse line, uh, for example, that has the recombinase only present in one cell type or another cell type and inject the virus into those animals. And we made viruses that allow multiple different recombinases to be required. And you can, we can do logic like you need A and B, A or B, A not B, different recombinases targeted different ways, defining cell types by virtue of multiple genetic features. This has been playing out at the same time as the development of optogenetics. And this is even getting more exciting. In, un in unpublished work, we've now made uh, triple recombinase viruses, so you can have cells defined by three genetic features, A and B and C. Only those cells will express the opsin. And so this is just a, an exciting time where we're advancing all, all uh, sides, all fronts uh, together. Question there in the back? <clears throat> oh, uh, all right. <clears throat> Since you got the microphone, we'll do you and then the other one. Yeah. Does it work, though? Oh, yeah. Um, so this is referring to your um, first demise story, which I thought is, is very cool. Um, can you speculate um, on what the benefit for the mouse is to <clears throat> crank up um, activity throughout the whole brain? Do they get better at seeking water? Are they faster? Are they more desperate? What's, what do you think uh, yeah. is the reason for this? Yeah, so, so why, what is the benefit to the mouse to have this very simple uh, motivated behavior to be encoded and represented across the entire brain? Um, I don't know the answer, uh, but I think uh, it's very likely that at some level, this is not going to be specific uh, to thirst. We're already starting to get hints this is going to be true of almost any action, almost any movement, that uh, essentially every part of the brain has to know at some level what the animal's action plan is. Uh, and this is relevant, as you, as you can imagine, certainly for sensory cortex. It's important for the sensory cortex to know that the animal is planning some actions that will cause sensory stimulation along the way. That's obviously helpful for sensory regions of the brain to know. And you can think about, uh, that's, a, that's a very clear, uh, obvious example, but uh, in, a, in a deeper sense, it may be important for uh, motivational parts of the brain, homeostatic parts of the brain, uh, movement, coordination, you know, uh, spatial orientation, planning, executive function. In at some sense, every part of the brain needs to know the action plan uh, of the animal and to ha have that actively represented and maintained. And how that information, we, we can now see that's the case. It, it is the case, and, and exactly how that information is used and why uh, 
I'm sure is going to be different in each region, but I suspect that's the underlying logic. Yes. Um, you talked about channels uh, that are partial to transport of a certain uh, charge ion, charged ions, and you said there is a way for you to switch. And uh, is that a process that you use for inhibition? Uh, that's one part of my question. The second part is. When you try to inhibit a particular region of the brain, do you do so by directly targeting that region, or do you do that by stimulating an another region of the brain to, to create? I don't, I'm new to this field, so I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah. yeah, so when we want to inhibit a part of the brain, that was your second question? Yeah, yeah when we want to inhibit a part of the brain, we, we can d directly deliver the inhibitory optogenetic tool to the part of the brain that we want to inhibit and illuminate that part of the, the, the brain with light and we see a suppression of activity of the cells that are expressing the inhibitory optogenetic tool right in that region. That, that is one way of doing it. It's probably the most common way of inhibiting that structure. You can do more refined things like just inhibiting the input to a region. So you might want to s just suppress the information coming from prefrontal cortex to a deep structure, for example. And so there you would use one of the inhibitory optogenetic tools. You could express it in cortex, but you could deliver light to the deep structure and hyperpolarize or inhibit the axon terminals, the connections from cortex arri arriving in the deep structure. And so you could get a, a projection-specific inhibition that way. What was your first question? Okay. Yeah. So the question is, uh, different cells, uh, well, di different channels, uh, intrinsically, uh, by, by design, conduct different kinds of, of ion. Uh, and our own channels that we make, we have different ion channels that we make in our neurons. Some conduct positive ions, some conduct negative ions, and those are used for excitatory or inhibitory purposes by our own cells. What we did was take a naturally cation conducting algal channel and used molecular tricks to turn it into an anion conducting channel, which was not naturally occurring in that algae, to mimic what our natural anion conducting channels do. That was the logic. Yeah. yeah. You describe many behavioral applications of optogenetics. I was wondering whether you intend to, or you are doing at the moment, uh, trying to address also um, if there is a material substrate for conscious. Is that something that, you know, as a psychiatrist and also optogenetic scientist, you are interested in and pursuing? The question is uh, consciousness. If I, yeah. So, of course, I think about that all the time. Everybody does. Uh, certainly, psychiatrists do, neuroscientists do. I, I don't have any uh, uh, good answers, I'm afraid. Um, I, I think the biggest, uh, there are two problems. One is defining consciousness, and number two is measuring consciousness. And these are as yet uh, unsolved, I would say. Uh, but uh, not to denigrate the question at all, it's one of the things that brought me into neuroscience, and maybe in our, in our lifetimes we'll, we'll get there. But I, I have no, no answers just yet. Um, I'm curious about the long-term effect of the light stimulation. So whether the mouse that you tested on uh, will get used to or to get uh, accustomed to these um, artificial stimulations, and then after a while it will lose the sense um, and will not react to the natural stimulation as it initially did. question is, uh, with long-term uh, optogenetic stimulation, would you cause some behavioral changes, some adaptive responses so the animals no longer respond? Um, certainly, uh, so two aspects to your question. One is, uh, 
the opsins themselves do desensitize with time, and so uh, you have to set up your stimulation paradigms to, to account for that. And that's why we designed these long-acting opsins that, that can give you very long, uh, stable effects uh, with just a brief flash of light. Now, you might have also been asking more about uh, the rest of the animal adapting to this uh, uh, situation. You know, what is, uh, if, you're, if, if you're modifying the action of this animal over the long time scale, do you get some adaptation of the rest of the brain? And this is actually pretty interesting. We've, we've actually touched on this, and other groups have too, uh, looking at what's called plasticity, long-term changes in behavior and even in synaptic uh, uh, properties that come with uh, long-term stimulation, and you, indeed you can see those effects. Uh, most of the work I showed you is very acute, just immediate dynamical responses, but we and others have indeed looked at these longer time scale effects, and you can get them, and they could be very interesting. So for example, we, we found that we could uh, suppress uh, anxiety and fear responses in ways that lasted at least a day, uh, uh, outlasting our plasticity-inducing stimulus may help us design long-acting therapies in the long run. So that's a, it's been a small part of my work, but a very interesting uh, future direction. In the back there, yeah. Oh, okay, I'll do this one first and then, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, so um, there's a lot of evidence now that um, neural ensembles and stuff uh, what kind of underlie a lot of processes, but are there now tools that we can use to not only activate a whole ensemble at one time, but also activate an ensemble with like different neurons being activated in a sequence? Yeah, great question. So can you activate ensembles in a sequence? Although I didn't dwell on it, the, the light guidance technology that I showed you allows exactly that. So for example, the orbital frontal cortex experiments, you can drive all the cells in synchrony, but you can also drive them asynchronously, exactly as you like, in any sequence you want. And so we can provide asynchronous ensembles with the light guidance uh, technology uh, extremely well. And we've applied that. We, we showed that, uh, and we've applied that now both in visual cortex and in, in orbifrontal cortex. Yeah, that's already possible. And I think uh, the last question, this is the final question, but as I'm instructed uh, uh, by my uh, masters. Uh, in the back there, yeah, you see? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I've shown you blue and red light activated channel rhodopsins. The question is, could you get more? It's a real problem uh, because they have very broad action spectra. This is probably how they evolved uh, to collect as much light as possible. And we have not yet found a microorganism that really had an evolutionary incentive to narrow that action spectrum to use these for, for specific uh, uh, detection. Those might exist out in nature, though. Uh, so we, I think one thing we might want to do is try to go find uh, a coding channel rhodopsin that's, that for some reason, some biological reason, has to be selected to a color of light. We haven't found it yet. Um, and uh, yeah. So is that, uh, I think we, we're, we may be out of time. I want to thank uh, all of you again, uh, uh, and our, our students, and, and uh, Michael Chen, and everybody else. OK, thank you. I do just, just want to say from all of us, as I think the questions showed, some of us in the audience, some of you I should say, live in the world of optogenetics and you've been inspired by both the work and the lecture that Carl Dyseroff gave us today. Others of us you took into the world of optogenetics with wonderful clarity. Um, I think perhaps some of us are going to go away, perhaps the parents in the room with the imagined idea of a light beam with which we could put our babies to sleep for the whole night and perhaps wake our teenagers up in the morning. <laughs> that might be not what the way you want to inspire us, but that thought nevertheless stays. Um,
Just before I ask you to join me in thanking Professor uh, Dr. Carl Dyseroth again, can I just remind you that tomorrow we have the other two Kyoto laureates, Joan Jonas and Professor Kashiwara, and you're very welcome to join us for those two lectures tomorrow. But please, for this moment, uh, join me on behalf of the Inamori Foundation um, and my colleagues here at the Blavatnik School of Government in thanking Professor Carl Dyseroth for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.